Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first virtual Diseño program. My name is Cristina de Leon, and I'm the Associate Curator of Latino Design here at Cooper Hewitt. Launched in 2014, Diseño is our annual two-part event that highlights the achievements of contemporary Latinx designers. Today's lecture will be followed by a workshop tomorrow, again at 2 p.m., which I encourage you all to sign up for if you haven't already. We are grateful to have the sustaining support of the Latino Initiatives Pool Fund and the Smithsonian Latino Center who have been fundamental in helping us continue this series. I am so pleased to welcome Tara Rodriguez Besosa. She is the co-founder of El Departamento de la Comida or the Department of Food, a queer grassroots sustainable food project based in Puerto Rico. This program has actually been a few years in the making. I had been following the work of El Departamento de la Comida for some time, but when a mutual friend put that and I in touch, I knew after our first conversation that I needed to invite her to a diseño program. When we spoke, it had been a little over a year after Hurricane Maria had devastated Puerto Rico. And we talked a lot about how the people on the island were working to rebuild not just their homes or the surrounding infrastructure, but every aspect of their lives. As a design museum, I think it's important for us to shed light on the people who are working on the ground in their communities, creating new design solutions with resources that are readily available. In many ways, Tara, her colleagues, and frankly, the people of Puerto Rico remind us that we all have the ability and the power to be designers, to find solutions to small and big problems that face our daily lives and to implement change. And what better way to begin this type of design thinking than with food? Something we all need to survive, yet so many are without food are unable to afford it or access healthy options. How do we design regenerative food systems? This is a huge challenge. And as we'll learn today, it's been the driving force behind El Departamento de la Comida's mission for the past 10 years. Following Tara's presentation, we'll open up the conversation for questions from the audience. I encourage you to input your questions into the Q&A feature and we'll be reading them out for Tara to answer. Many, many thanks to all of you for taking the time to be with us today. You could have been anywhere in the virtual world and you've decided, decided to join us here. So thank you. I hope you enjoy. Tara, over to you. Thank you, Cristina. Um, estoy sumamente honrada de estar presente hoy. La charla la voy a dar en inglés eh, y espero que aquellas personas que no hayan entendido algo puedan entonces luego contactarse conmigo en confianza. Eh, se supone que también haya interpretación en algunas partes para aquellos que necesiten. Mi nombre es Tara Rodríguez Besosa. Eh, antes de comenzar, me gustaría reconocer que estamos en tiempos sumamente difíciles uh, I would like uh, everybody to just take a moment and take a breath and just feel all of the things that are going on around us. Um, there's definitely a global pandemic. A lot of people's lives have changed. Some people are having difficulty breathing at this moment. And I would really like this uh, sharing today to be in support of that. And I want to place it within this present context, even though I will be sharing a little bit of the past 10 years. So I am going to share my screen and begin. So a little bit of who I am and where I am. My name is Tara, I'm 36 years young. I am a white privileged queer Boricua. My pronouns are she, her, they, them, AX. I currently live between a queer 
Land Sanctuary in San Salvador, Caguas. And I also go back and forth between there and here, uh, where I have electricity and running water and internet signal, uh, which is a 1930s Art Deco apartment in Santurce. Um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I spent a few years of my childhood in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in the late 80s and early 90s. I studied and moved to New York for seven years in the early 2000s. I graduated from Pratt Institute's Department of Agri uh, not Agriculture, Architecture um, in 2007. I was raised by my father, Jose, and my mother, Silka. And I'm very lucky to have a younger yet older sister, Daniela, who is a farmer, a mother of two young beings, and a very active spokesperson for agroecology in Puerto Rico. We were actually raised mostly on water, on sailboats. Um, and now I just find myself much more inland, although working on a different part of uh, what that water supports. So the project I'll be talking about um, for the next 60 minutes is El Departamento de la Comida. Um, it's 10 years old, but many more in the making. And I also like to present that this comes from, you know, previous life, life experiences, being a part of a collectively run DIY gallery space in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, this is a photograph of um, Serban Ionescu, who I wanted to shout out, who's one of those people that uh, definitely made it possible for me to be here today. And I thank him a lot. Um, I also was uh, the co-founder of a space in Santurce called El Local in Santurce. Um, it was a DIY creative venue. It also act as a speakeasy or a legal unpermitted bar, uh, a music space, a gallery, a cafe, and just a regular hangout spot for local creatives. Um, a lot of the work that I did there very much got me into the whole local creative scene um, from a different point of view. These are, for example, zines that I used to do with other people from El Local. I started out when I moved back to Puerto Rico just doing graphic design anywhere I could find. Uh, this is a project that I worked on with the other co-founder of El Departamento de la Comida, who was my partner at the time, Olga Casellas Badillo, an amazing designer as well. And without her, none of this Department of Food would have been possible. And so I just wanted to share a little bit of the work very quickly. This is uh, some graphic design that I did for La Organización Boricua de Agricultores Ecológicos. Uh, I did a lot of support work for other events and farmers markets when I started to work with them and just started using my computer from college that I had paid for um, through student debt and my free Photoshop at the time to just get more involved with what has become my passion for the last 10 years. Um, so I would like to give thanks um, to the legacy of both my mother and her own life decisions, my sister, her amazing dedication to farming, my grandfather's life as an architect and a photographer, my father's gift to us of the sea, my grandmother Gloria, my other grandmother Susie, the loving, cheerful, and sarcastic choreographer, my other grandfather's aunts, uncles, cousin, as well as my chosen family, some of which are in New York City, others who are in Borigang, others who are in California, Philly, and around the world. Um, El Departamento de la Comida, like all of us, is a living, breathing organism, and it's imperfect, and it just turned 10 years in July 2020. I dedicate this next hour to all of the hands and hearts and mouths that have been a part of our Department of Food throughout the years, and may this work continue to free us. So I wanted to give a little bit of context um, very quickly. I can't talk about the history of Puerto Rico uh, in five minutes um, and be able to touch on everything, but just wanted to share as a quick landing. So this is where our project is based. Puerto Rico means rich port. Three million of us uh, live on the islands 
and more than 6 million Puerto Ricans live in the diaspora of the United States and around the world. We currently import 85% of our food, and this number is something that I used to increase up until 90 when I did the numbers after Post Maria. And then I started to realize that actually this number could possibly be less uh, of the amount of consumption of local Puerto Rican crops, considering that there's a whole undercurrent of crops that are being exchanged and sold that are not necessarily a part of a census per se. Um, its indigenous name is Boriquen, and it comes from the Tainos. Um, they traded with much of the Caribbean, Central and South America. Most of our food crops were based on these trade routes, as well as Spanish and Africans um, that were also a part of this food system and that have become a big part of our culinary um, heritage. We are a colony of the United States and all political, social, economic, ecological front lines are directly connected to our fight for autonomy, justice, and sovereignty from this colonial status. El Departamento de la Comida is a project that focuses on food sovereignty and therefore seed sovereignty as a way to ensure our cultural legacy and to heal ongoing wounds and traumas and take our population's unhealthy farming and eating practices into our own hands. El Departamento de la Comida is a name that is meant very specifically to sound like a government agency, both as a replacement for the systems that do not serve us, as well as a sarcastic comment to the very much uh, indecent and ineffective amount of government agencies and institutions, all of which fail to support healthy, local, and regenerative practices. Puerto Rico is also a target for foreign investments, tax credits, real estate, and biotechnology. Right now, it is one of the main seed producers of GMO cotton and soybean. I also wanted to quickly talk about the definition of food sovereignty. Uh, so what is food sovereignty? Food sovereignty is the people's right in caps, to define their agricultural and food policy without also dumping right to any other countries. Food sovereignty includes prioritizing local agricultural production in order to feed people. Access for peasants and landless people to land, water, and seeds, and even credit. The need for land reforms, fighting against GMOs, free access to seeds, and safeguarding water as a public good are a very important part to be distributed sustainably to these populations. It also includes the rights of farmers and peasants to produce food and the right of consumers to be able to decide what they consume and how and by whom it is produced. The right of countries to protect themselves from low priced agricultural and food imports, as is the case with Puerto Rico. The right of populations to take part in the choices within agricultural policy and the recognition of women and may I say queer and trans rights, specifically when it comes to farmers who play a major role in agricultural production and in food. So where does this concept of food sovereignty come from? Uh, the concept of food sovereignty was developed by La Via Campesina and I will quote them. Neoliberal policies prioritize international trade and not food for the people. They haven't contributed at all to hunger eradication in the world. On the contrary, they've increased the people's dependence on agricultural imports and have strengthened the industrialization of agriculture, thus jeopardizing the genetic, cultural, and environmental heritage of our planet, as well as our health. They have forced hundreds of millions of farmers to give up their traditional agricultural practices to rural exodus or to emigration. And a lot of that is very directly related to all the farmers that have had to leave Puerto Rico in different times during our history. Agricultural policies have to support sustainable family farm based agriculture in the north and the south in order to be able to make food sovereignty work. Countries have to be able to support their agriculture and guarantee the right to food of their populations to preserve their environment, develop sustainable agriculture, and protect themselves against dumping. 
They should also be able to support their agriculture to fulfill other public interests that can differ according to countries and cultural traditions. So what can be done concretely according to La Via Campesina? Supporting no, uh, local and national initiatives and actions such as land occupation, sustainable farm production initiatives, the defense of local seeds, actions against GMOs and dumping, etc. It is also very important to bring this debate into the organizations, governments, and institutions that might not yet be included into this conversation. I would also quickly like to mention a brief uh, definition of agroecology. It's an integrated approach that simultaneously applies ecological and social concepts and principles to the design and management of food systems. It seeks to optimize the interactions between plants, animals, humans, and the environment while taking into consideration, and very important here, the social aspects that need to be addressed for a sustainable and fair food system. And I would also like to speak a little bit about queerness. This is uh, something that I was watching this morning. Uh, her name is Margaret Grabowicz. Uh, she's Polish, uh, raised in Texas. And she was just sharing how nature's just weird. And it doesn't make the kind of sense that we want it to make. It doesn't make the judgments or moralizations and environmentalism sometimes actually even demands that it makes a certain kind of sense. Uh, she says that this um, author, Timothy Morton, frequently does this exercise where he's like, yeah, you, do you see gay people? You know, have they been eradicated over the hundreds of thousands of years in the same as disabled people? Yes, they still exist and that's for a reason. And that's because our DNA has always included them. And therefore it's not part of the society that continues to exclude them, what nature is sharing, uh, sharing with us. And so life and queerness, deviation, disability, the weird, the uncanny, always finds a way, which is something that is also a quote from Jurassic Park that she uses. My own learnings about my mind body have been through unlearning a lot of stuff that sadly comes from a heteronormative monoculture based capitalist society. My own upbringing as beautiful and loving as it was still came with notions of good and bad definitions of success that are rigid corporate, unreal, and full of taboos. My own body mind went through a certain conditioning that I am still to this day unlearning. I am so, so grateful for entering into queerness as a different understanding of the world around me where the possibilities are quite broad and limitless. It has also been important to think about this because my mind body is the vessel from which I am interacting with food and other people. For me, there's no such thing as agroecology or food sovereignty if we do not apply it to our own families, our own communities, and our own soils. I often think about the ironies of the so-called back to the land or the agroecologists that are also misogynist or homo transphobic. This has been a personal interest of mine within a very macho oriented field of agriculture in Puerto Rico. So I'm going to share today a little bit of the strategies and challenges uh, and also some of the lessons that we think as a collective have been useful for others to learn from with a common goal of supporting food sovereignty in our communities. And let's be clear that the strategies that have worked for us may not work in other places. So take what you can and leave what you want. Instead of focusing on what was successful or not, the design processes can be looked at as a way to gain a better understanding of how design has been so important within social, political, and ecological movements. In our case, we've realized that it's better to have more people participate in the design process. And just as we fight for more people to have access and participation in our food system, it is just as important that they also have more access and participation in the design process of these new systems that we are putting into practice. After thinking what might be a better use of the 60 minutes of time over Zoom um, for this lecture, while I was flipping through thousands and thousands of photographs of the last 10 years, getting really excited and nostalgic, hundreds of articles that have been done on El Departamento and other comrades, 
I just wasn't sure if I should share all of that, but I also thought and spoke to my coworkers that sharing the core values of El Departamento de la Comida, a product of all of these challenges and lessons learned, well, I decided to do a little bit of both. El Departamento de la Comida has gone through a bunch of different models in the past 10 years. We started out as a CSA, we had a website, we had a bus that picked up once or twice a week produce from different farms around the island. We then moved into different spaces, two in Santurce, and we now have a new space in San Salvador Caguas. We participated in hundreds, if not thousands of events over the last 10 years. Uh, markets, uh, farmers markets, pop-up dinners, Nuestra Mesa dinners, which is a dinner that we do that literally translates into our table, seed exchanges, workshops, cooking classes, meetings, you name it. We worked on several campaigns, educational and through social media. Uh, we started with Que No Se Pierda La Cosecha, May the Harvest Not Be Lost. We are now working on a campaign called Que No Se Pierda La Semilla. We've also had Brigadas Solidarias or Solidarity Brigades. And right now, a lot of what we're working on are shared resources or programs, thinking that everybody has to be a part of food sovereignty. And so it's actually not our responsibility to accomplish that. It's our responsibility to be able to provide some collective resources within this. And so our Agroteca resource library space our food hub spaces that have also in many moments been event spaces for movie screenings, parties, concerts, dinners. We've participated in a lot of community gardening, both in urban and rural areas. And we've acted throughout the years, uh, unconsciously, I think, and recently have been talking a lot about our role as an alternative agency to those agencies that I spoke about don't serve us. Um, the DEPA branding, everything around the logos, everything around the t-shirts, the merch, uh, the tote bags, the stickers, the product labels, menu designs and posters, all of those come from our personal experiences and also the larger context of food sovereignty in Puerto Rico. Um, and we've gone through CSA distribution models. We've had a store both online and physical and pop-ups. We had a, one of the only kitchens, commercial kitchens in Puerto Rico that only used local sustainable produce uh, bought at fair trade prices. Uh, we've run under a food hub model and all the different specifications and the spectrum of what that means. Post Hurricane Maria, when we basically lost all of our space, we started solidarity brigades with other people and organizations for about a year and a half or two years. And lately uh, we've done a transition from what was originally an individually owned corporation to a nonprofit collective. Also understanding that the revolution will not be funded, understanding what are the strategies behind becoming a nonprofit collective. So I am going to share um, my screen real quick to put on this video, bear with me. It takes about six minutes and this is my sharing of what I found of the last 10 years. I'm being told that it's not being seen. <laughs> Apologize for that. Um, give me a second, please. See if this works.
I did forget to introduce that I am next to a poleo plant that is accompanying me uh, on my journey right now. Forgot to shout it out. 
Um, so I am going to share for the time that we have left um, our core values. And this is something that I would really like to thank the people at Wildfire Project for part of the steps in the process of becoming a nonprofit collective um, came from the drive of really sharing not only a lot of the responsibilities, but um, a lot of the goals with uh, the other people. Um, and so I'm just going to share our core values one by one. Um, communities know best. La comunidades saben mejor. Eh, not only do they taste better in Spanish, but they also have the knowledge. Uh, that's a weird translation. Sorry about that. So this automatically puts us in a plural, not individual um, sense of knowledge to begin with. And this requires us to define what community is for us as well. In our case, we have the geographic community of San Salvador. This is our new space. Um, and we also form a part of the people and ecosystems of the community of San Turce, where our other two spaces have been. We also form parts of communities of the different farms around the islands that we are in collaboration and relationship with. And we also form a part of other types of communities, like the queer community, the seed keeping community, the diaspora community of Puerto Rico, and different types of family units um, that we are accountable to. When designing, when making decisions, our communities are what my sister Charlin says, that high council. They're not necessarily what usually people say are like, you know, the experts, nor the bosses, nor the big orgs, they're us. And this goes beyond just participatory design because communities work together. And what we should do is include ourselves in that community if we are a part of it, starting by taking out the idea of an individual or just a collective. And if we're not a part of a community, then we should be able to understand our role as visitors. Many groups have had difficult experiences, specifically Post Maria, and I know that other uh, places and communities can speak for this as well, where all of a sudden people and organizations and groups come in and they don't necessarily understand, right, their role in the community as visitors or as decision makers. And there are still a lot of people in orgs that are lurking around that continue to do that. We are forever students. Um, we ask for feedback from our constituents in designing our programs. We're not assuming that we know the answers, we're asking others. And I also wanted to point out that a lot of the design of El Departamento de la Comida in these past two years particularly has been thanks to a lot of actual college students that have come to quote unquote intern with us and have actually done more amazing work than I could have ever done. Um, and so I'm very, very grateful to those people who have really been a part of the design process as well. I also wanted to share that each time you learn something new and you put it into practice, your brain will either change the structure of its neurons, those cells that are inside of it, or it'll increase the synapses between your neurons, allowing them to send and receive information faster. So to put it shortly, the more you know, the more you are able to stretch your brain's capacity for more learning. Celebrating the beauty and experience of food. Celebrando la belleza y la experiencia de la comida. So this one, I always think of my friend Aura, who's in New York City, who always shares with me the most amazing aperitivos and meals in the hardest of times. This one goes out to her. She's also one of our board members. Food is culture. We are working with the culture of food and farming. So sharing food is healing and conversations shared over a meal matter. There's a big difference between sharing a meal at your typical fast food restaurant and sharing a meal that in itself, those ingredients are letting you being able to imagine, right? And be in a place where you can be free also mentally. Beauty is something that I believe all people deserve to experience. We do not do the work that we do with El Departamento under any obligation. 
This is not some abstract mission that only a few elites can have access to food and live in a beautiful place, whatever that may mean. We do the work because it's precisely because of this abundance, this celebration of food for all of us. And we know that without this experience, we do not learn as much as we could. We want to feel it. We don't just want to do it. And we want others to be able to experience the beauty and celebrate that beauty with us. We grow it, we eat it, we control it. Decolonizing land and food, power to the people, food sovereignty. This is like a summed up version of what La Via Campesina was sharing. Our approach should be a whole systems approach, holistic, understanding that this is all part of food sovereignty. It also allows us to be able to work on different parts of our food system, depending on what we enjoy more, what we want to do, where we are at, what our limits might be. And so that's something that I just wanted to bring up. And I'm just gonna pause the slide on Nati, you learning how to use the grillo. <laughs> Um, at our farm. I can plant one day, I can cook it another, I can compost it another, I can eat it another, and pardon my French, but fuck separation and specialization in the fields. We want the person that grows the plantains to be able to also cook and eat the plantains. And this also allows us to think about strategies that go beyond this term of food security and towards community controlled shared resources that free us. No project is too small, but some projects are too big. We believe in a collective culture. Oops, sorry about that. And pause. <laughs> we believe in a collective culture of decentralized small farmers, not agro industry with few landowners and employees galore. We wanna support projects that are at a local level. So that's one of the reasons why this is an important value for El Departamento de la Comida. Scale has always been a thing for me and I don't know, it's because I studied architecture. Um, my favorite works are from John Haydock who was the Cooper of Cooper Union for a long time, the Dean, sorry. They could fit um, on a piece of paper in a book, a lot of them were not necessarily even constructed pieces of architecture, but they were the size of a chair or they at least took into consideration that chair and allowed therefore my body and my thoughts to be held. My thesis in architecture school looked specifically into his project of victims, which spoke about these kissings and the time in such an intimate scale. And that is really what I love about working with food and farming. So also, I just wanted to share that in Spanish and in Puerto Rico, we use this a lot. It's a phrase, el que mucho o la que mucho um, abarca poco aprieta. The person who casts their net so far and wide is going to have a really hard time bringing it in. And it's this idea of not only thinking of that mile wide inch deep, but really going deeper, even though that might mean I can't reach as far wide. working at a life-affirming pace. And this is a slide of Vero, who at many moments when we're at our collective farm, Otra Cosa, I'm like busy bumblebee with like all the different things that we need to do. And it's hurricane season and this house has been abandoned for 30 years. And then I just see her kind of like start picking ingredients and foraging very basic ingredients that we have around and she kind of just like goes and starts going into her own world. And it always reminds me that if this work doesn't support and affirm our human needs, it's not sustainable and it's not developing the type of culture that we actually wanna be a part of and for future generations. Simply put as well, a lot of what I tell myself is don't burn out, don't be a burnout, right? And this is actually not the kind of work that we're about and I don't really think that putting our well being under the bus is a part of this purpose. And many times this creates a very ironic, you know, and kind of F up relationship between activists, environmentalists, supporters of a cause, 
and the actual life that they are creating. I can say that from a very personal um, experience as well. Pushing the edge of what's possible. So let's not let the status quo define our options. We know that. This also means to me that in order to push the edge of what's possible, we actually need to let go. We need to not think that we can control nature, which is also one of the major situations that we're dealing with now with a certain kind of environmentalism. Um, and we can't control climate change right now. We can't control what a lot of people think. And we also can't control what they think is possible. Allowing ourselves to be open to a vast array of possibilities is key to pushing that edge. And I think a lot about when you practice yoga, that edge is the place in your practice where you're being sufficiently challenged, but not so much that you're experiencing pain, strain, or injury, which goes back to working at a life-affirming pace. A lot of people, when we started El Departamento de la Comida, were like, you can't do a all local and sustainable food hub thing in 2010 in Puerto Rico. And like, you guys are under 40 and you're queer women. And we created that and we pushed the edge of what was possible, obviously, because we also learned that there were people before us, a lot of people before us that helped pave and open that way. And on the right, you'll see a slide of one of our campaigns, Que no se pierda la cosecha, where we started realizing that it was up to us to also support those people that wanted to access different produce and products, but we weren't able to accept food stamps at that moment because we were not an acceptable business for food stamps. So we created our own food stamp situation, very simple pieces of paper on a bulletin board. If you had five cents, $5, I see $10 in there. It didn't matter and somebody could use that. Polyculture, polycultura. This is a table of seeds um, at a seed exchange at the Jardín Ecológico de San Salvador. Shout out to them. Um, everything on that table is a community controlled seed supply. And so this is not even seeds from all over Puerto Rico. These are just different seeds from people we are in relationship with. And you can see on the bottom left, we always have like a basket of all the seeds that belong to like really amazing seed companies, but we really try to separate them so people understand like everything, all the polyculture that is around us. And so strength through diversity and interdependence, the care, right, of people, plants and projects all together. It's the opposite of monoculture, this notion that we can create environments of one kind, of one plant, that focuses on quality, quantity, and uniformity in a particular way. It's one of the reasons we also use pesticides and a lot of labor and violence goes into maintaining monoculture as well as a lot of eradication. Think about also when I spoke earlier about queerness and think about disability. This denies the relationships and the culture that we are actually all a part of. Accepting and celebrating different forms of being for us as humans, as well as our relationship with plants and ecosystems so that we can actually learn more from them. Experiment, adapt, evolve. This is a, like an iterative process, right? Experiment, adapt, evolve. Experiment, adapt, evolve. And this allows us to grow, learn, improve, all happening at the same time. Experiments actually bring a lot of failure, but they also let you learn through those failures. And I think that's one of the things that more than success is, El Departamento de la Comida has been based on a lot of learnings of failures. <laughs> um, adapting is crucial, right? Mostly because it means we're in a constant learning process, as I was sharing earlier. When you experiment, you also, it's very important to adapt so that you can actually say, I would like this experiment to succeed, right? And so let me adapt this during the process. I don't have to think so fixedly. And that has to do a lot of why, like with why El Departamento has used so many different models throughout the years. Um, 
so be open in your experimentation process with changing your mind. And evolution is what actually happens after we experiment and adapt so many, so many times, we start to realize that we weren't just like all over the place, right? We were creating a much larger movement. And this photo is of my dear friend, Jerome, who is one of my favorite cooks of El Departamento de la Comida. Looks like a regular barbecue, but this is actually a photo when we didn't have electricity um, and we didn't know what to do. And we also had a lot of produce that was gonna go to waste. And we also just really needed to like make our weekly, you know, uh, money to be able to pay our rent. So we decided to start a barbecue or what we call a barbecue queer, take the kitchen outside, take the cooks outside and just kind of like promote a different approach to what our restaurant was. Interdependence. Interdependence is all about recognizing our context, right? All things are related and we design by leaning into this rather than trying to become modular or totally independent. So we're completely dependent on stuff and let us accept that, right? We're dependent on other people. We need each other. We also need healthy ecosystems. Our independence should not be a loss, right? In order to have interdependence. And so when we accept that our independence can also be interdependent, we can go much further. Puerto Rico first. Um, or Boriquen uh, primero. So why is this important uh, for El Departamento de la Comida? We're in relationship with many groups and many people. We want our work to really support our islands, right? Not just like the larger context of movements. Um, we also wanna dedicate our energy on projects that put this place first, because this is where we're doing the work. We knew that we would get amazing offers to travel, to collaborate with other places and people and organizations and coalitions. We have done that. And one of our main things about Puerto Rico First means that we really need to bring all of those learnings and people and organizations back home. And looking back also, this is very important to me because well, I also was very much um, out more than I was in for a long time with El Departamento de la Comida. This work did take me all around the world. And sometimes I was more in, you know, California or New York or Thailand or Japan than I was in my own home. And so recognizing that even though travel and exploration has been very important and sharing with these amazing groups the work, um, well, it's in my best interest as an individual and in the best interest of my community and my family to be present in this place. Work that heals, heals and builds resilience. Trabajo que sana y crea resiliencia. And this is a photo of Lex with some sugar cane and maraca and hobo and bananas, uh, the balcony of our somewhat uh, abandoned, not anymore house at Otra Cosa, which is a queer farm uh, land project. This goes for land, right? We wanna do work that heals and builds resilience for land, communities, different identities, life at all levels. Oftentimes we think of resilience as defined as something like when people or animals have survived no matter what, right? Or despite and against all odds and obstacles. Yes, that is totally true, but for me, what is important during this voyage and during that work is to actually heal. Because a lot of the times, the people that are actually doing this resilience work are the ones that need the most healing and support in healing. And so resilience is something that you continue to you know, nurture, right? As a body, as a person. Um, so, Let's uh, just say that for me, like one of the things that I think of when I hear the word resilience, I think also of brilliance, like they sound very much alike. I think of brightness. I think of something that goes much beyond survival mode. And last but not least, agriculture, not agro-industry. Shout out to Huerta Semilla and all the people that form a part of that beautiful group. 
Um, so we're talking about culture versus industry when it comes to food. And many times agro industry is actually eradicating agriculture. Let's not be mistaken. <laughs> so we don't wanna commoditize our work and our lives in a capitalistic way. Not everything needs to be bought nor sold. So let's go back to the simple idea that we have a goal of feeding ourselves and our families and our communities. So not thinking that we have to participate in the very systems that have been designed to extract from us. This allows the definition of what a farmer is to broaden. And many of the people who we work with through El Departamento de la Comida are culture bearers, right? They're not registered necessarily with the Department of Ag. Um, they're probably not even counted between those numbers, right? And I think this is really important because it allows us to open up the fact that all of us need to be participants in our food system and food culture. Um, and again, wherever I can be a part of this, I am accepted. And so this also brings us into the beautiful world, uh, world of what bartering or trueque means, right? What gifting means and what magic means, which is, I think, one of the main things that I am fighting for with El Departamento de la Comida and that I definitely know that agro-industry is trying to eradicate. And I say that for the work that we've been doing in Puerto Rico, a place that also has been tried to be eradicated and is magical at the same time. So, uh, that is it. Um, I guess this is my time uh, being conscious that I was allowed this amount. I hope it was useful and I can share with anybody the slides. Um, just want to say hi, just want to hear any comments or questions. I would really like to thank uh, Cristina and Adriana and Maggie and the group. It has been a very difficult uh, personal time for me in these past few months and they have been very supportive of making this happen. Please follow us on social media at El Departamento de la Food. Comida didn't fit on Instagram. Que no se piela la semilla. Also, if you're respectful of my space and celebrate uh, my life in abundance, you can follow me on Bitch and Manolo. Manolo is my cat. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you again and a shout out for all of the people that are actually not speaking right now, but have definitely been a part of this 10 year voyage. Um, so I am going to stop. Oh, and one last thing tomorrow, like Christina mentioned, uh, we have a workshop with Lex Barlow and Jacqueline Pilati. Um, around particularly seed libraries as one of those shared resources um, that El Departamento de la Comida has been working on. And we will be sharing a little bit more about our present day work with our resource library or Agroteca. So I am going to stop my share. Is that good? Perfect, thank you, Tara. Thank you so much for that really inspiring um, presentation. That was so fantastic to, to just see the journey that you guys have been on, um, you all have been on for the past 10 years. We have so many great questions. Um, before I get to the Q&A box, I just wanted to quickly ask you, because um, this came up in the chat, who is the artist that sang in the video that you sh you shared and and what is the name of the song uh so <laughs> ali um is a part of our farm collective um and so i can give this song to anybody who wants this is actually not a commercial artist this is my sister and this is a song that we sing in front of the fire and at the farm a lot its chorus is Las Plantas a mi me dan medicina, the plants they give me medicine. And she actually just recorded this on her phone uh, last week so that we could include because I felt that it was important to share where I'm coming from. Um, and I just really sing this song all the time. So her name is Ali. I can find her Instagram handle in a second if she has one, Alexandra. <laughs> 
uh, while you ask another question, I'll try and like figure that out. Okay, so first question from Alejandro Vasquez. Uh, I'm a current student at Farm School NYC, a BIPOC and queer positive farming organization in New York. Um, while not Boricua myself, he's from Cuban Spanish heritage, I have a very strong connection to Borinquen and feel my future in farming is tied to the island. I don't want to propagate the colonization structures and don't want to become a gentrifier um, as a non-Puerto Rican, what do you think my first steps in farming and food sovereignty should be on the island? Whoa, so we get this question a lot. <laughs> um, and first off, I would say you can go through a bunch of different options. Option number one, for the same cost of you having this experience, you could also support an existing project in Puerto Rico uh, right now, we're in really difficult times. A lot of local Puerto Ricans are not actually happy about getting visitors. Um, and obviously this is a case by case scenario, uh, but during COVID we have been very open to tourists and our numbers are really high right now. Uh, even though flights are cheap, a lot of what we ask people to also think about is you can do the work from wherever you are. And sometimes that $300 plane ticket and all of the money that you spend on getting all the materials to come could literally just be given to somebody here if that's something that you would like to do. If you really wanna come and be a part of a farm project, I can definitely put you in contact. We are a real group. Uh, we don't go to some like automatic email system. So you can just email us at info at el departamento de la comida .org. And depending on where you want to go, how long, what you want to do, etc. We can just help you to connect with other farm projects, a lot of which do uh, accept visitors and volunteers. Um, a lot of the work that we did post Hurricane Maria really allowed us to see um, what it means to go help on farms and not be extracted, right? Um, and be very, very purposeful with the amount of time and space because for any farmer, the help is very supportive, but there is an amount of time that they also need to dedicate to the person who's coming for the first time, you know, in teaching them what it is that needs to happen, et cetera. Um, and I also just wanna encourage that you, you know, eh, you will not be a gentrifier and we're here to support you. We're all learning as well. I make a lot of mistakes uh, on my way there. Um, so just get in contact with us and I think just connecting with us. Uh, if it's not us, I can also just connect you with other projects uh, where you live as well. Thank you. Next question, which is a little bit of a follow up. Um, which is asking, do you know any agricultural organizations that a person can get involved with when visiting Puerto Rico? Yes. Um, so right now, again, um, Puerto Rico is not necessarily uh, the best place to visit. <laughs> um, but yes, there are many, including El Departamento de la Comida. Um, so we have on our website a place where you can just write us directly if you want to volunteer. And there are other organizations, but more than organizations, I would say, and this just like has to do with Puerto Rican culture in general, a lot of people come and they just stay with a farm. Um, it's very one-on-one. -on -one. They're not necessarily these organizations. I mean, a few of these big organizations exist, but I would prefer that you connect directly with farmers and definitely just hit us up. Uh, there is also woofing and uh, farm stays and stuff like that, definitely available in Puerto Rico when it is the proper time to come and visit us. Okay, next question. As you say that the revolution is not funded, how has your collective gotten by all these years? Is there crowdfunding and how often does that occur? Or is the way you operate a model that is similar to how you farm or how you experience ever-changing dynamics? How have you developed a financial framework to continuous, uh, due to continuous challenges? 
That's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> um, because it's the one that I'm always thinking about. This project has actually been really hard. The hardest thing has been to keep it open. Um, and it's not just because of hurricanes, it's been because as many may know, any kind of small business or organization in Puerto Rico doesn't really get any support. Um, and we're competing, you know, when we were a CSA, when we were a restaurant, we had to pay, you know, a lot of taxes. We also had to pay accountants and permits. And so the biggest task that I have had um, has been keeping it out of closing um, for financial reasons. How have I accomplished it? We started with a $10,000 loan from a friend um, that got us a used vehicle and our website and paid for some boxes and about three months of labor uh, from two friends that worked with us. So I've put in a lot of hours. I would say 90 to 95% of my last 10 years have been unpaid. Although I also didn't want to right, uh, be able to fall into that. What I did in that case with myself at least is I got paid through free meals. So I was eating um, you know, amazing food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner while we had a restaurant, even though the highest I ever got paid was about $300 a week for a very full-time job. Um, one of the reasons why we decided to become a nonprofit collective after looking at a lot of different like co-op models and we might actually open our kitchen program through a co-op is because we looked forward and we saw that there was a lot of existing funding for the next five to 10 years um, for specifically like nonprofits working in agriculture and food. And so being strategic around that, right? Um, For-profit, nonprofit, it's very similar and it all has to do with how you set yourself up um, in terms of bylaws and you know different agreements that you make. I would also share that um, when my mother passed away, um, I inherited a very surprising amount of money through some random life insurance that we never even knew she had. And I used that money to keep El Departamento alive for two years. That's the first time I say this in public, but a lot of times it just takes for personal finances um, and it just takes a lot of like extra labor. I would say though that part of the reason why we went through all these different models was to figure out the economic sustainability of them. What do I need to be a sustainable CSA? In our case, to cover our operating expenses at that moment, we needed to distribute a goal of 200 boxes a week um, in order to cover all of our expenses. Um, right now, you know, we do a lot of things that have to do with what does it mean to be sustainable? How can we accomplish this? But also not needing necessarily to stretch too much beyond this because what I have learned is that whether I close this as a corporation or a business or not, this work does continue. Um, and I can definitely say in the same way that we think about polyculture, as this person mentioned, you don't necessarily have to dedicate yourself to just one thing. Right now we do crowdfunding and I've done crowdfunding um, for many years. It's very helpful at some times. At other times it's too tedious. Um, other times we write grants. We just got an SBA loan um, because of COVID that is supporting us for certain operations. Um, we've done a little bit of everything and sometimes it's all at the same time. We also have a Patreon um, that actually is paying our accountant for the next year, which is the most important thing to have. Um, and so, yeah, we just really try. A lot of it though, I would have to say is based on trueque, bartering. So when we work with farmers and we give them pro bono consultation uh, on their food projects, we also ask for something in exchange just for us. When we do workshops, if we can't you know, finance them, we ask other people to participate in what is needed financially to make that workshop possible. So I think distribution is a good word. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip around a little bit with these questions. Um, 
Throughout your work, what has been your most surprising and or exciting discovery about the polyculture of Puerto Rico? About my work, what has been <laughs> the most exciting discovery of polyculture in Puerto Rico? I just feel surrounded by it, to be honest. Um, Puerto Rico is one of these places that's like a continent on a, you know, a small series of islands. Um, right now, what I'm actually learning more about that might be related to polyculture is just like queer indigeneity um, and how different um, indigenous people had didn't work with binaries. Um, and so that's something that I'm doing a lot of research on specifically around um, different people that lived in the Caribbean and Central and, and South America. Um, I think that Puerto Rico is very polycultural. Um, and that's something that we also have spoken for a lot when it comes to food, because one of the things in terms of Puerto Rican identity when it comes to food is everybody used to say when I first started El Departamento, like, what the hell are you guys doing? Like Puerto Rican food is rice and beans and pork. That's it. And we were like, actually, no. <laughs> um, rice hasn't been grown in more than, you know, like a century. 90% of our pork is actually imported. And so really broadening that idea that Puerto Rico is much more than rice and beans and pork and bringing in not only medicinal plants, like my friend over here, I don't know if you can see her, um, being able to really recognize that Puerto Rico is one of these places where things are abundant. They grow out of the sidewalks. Like we literally have purslane growing out of the sidewalk. We have amaranth growing out of the sidewalk. And also in terms of polyculture, we've always been this archipelago that is like in constant movement. In the same way that like people have been coming back and forth and traveling in and out of Puerto Rico, so has our food culture been defined by these, you know, travels. And that's something that I really want to bring forth and forward, specifically when talking about medicinal plants and healing. And just following up with that answer that you gave, Tara, um, there's another question here about how your farming style um, has been influenced or has um, thought about the relationship to Puerto Rico's native ecological habitat and wildlife populations. Can you say that again? Sorry. <laughs> I guess the question is, how are you thinking about, how are you using or considering Puerto Rico's landscape, um, both what grows wild and um, also the native species population, like animal, wildlife, um, in your farming practices? So, okay. Um, it's kind of a tough question to answer. I would say that uh, despite what a lot of people might think, there's not one inch of Puerto Rico that has not been touched or modified uh, by humans. A lot of the mammals and animals that are actually present here were not from here originally. Um, there are a lot of plants that are endemic and there's a difference between endemic and native plants. Um, in terms of the food that we used to cook in the restaurant, we were more based on what farmers were growing because we were trying to guarantee the sales of their crops. Um, and what I'm doing now, I am not a commercial farmer. I actually don't even consider myself to be a farmer. I am a student. Um, what I'm doing now on our own land ecosystem is starting to identify and learn what's here, where it came from, and without eradicating it, right? And sometimes a lot of, you know, this idea of the word weeds and all of that comes to mind. And I even learned from some neighbors like, oh, that plant's a weed. And I was like, actually, when I look it up at home, it's the most magical medicine in the world. Um, a lot of my practices is just finding out, right, uh, whether it has a use for myself um, culinary wise, I also still want to learn from the plant and those seeds because 
a lot of the things that I'm really interested in working on on our own land has to do with not necessarily us, but the pollinators. Um, and those pollinators are birds and bees. And so in terms of what are the original crops of Puerto Rico, that is something very difficult to answer. When the Spaniards came to Puerto Rico, there was already corn, uh, yuca existed, Tainos used to eat a lot of shells and fish and different type of um, non-plant uh, foods. Uh, they used to trade a lot. So I'm still learning a lot of like what I would consider native or not native in that sense. I would just say that I'm not necessarily trading kale seeds. I'm trading achote seeds. Um, we're very interested in a lot of um, crops like root vegetables, which are, you know, I would consider like a very important part of our history, particularly because they are hurricane resilient. And so crops that I know that for many, many years people have grown here that can resist hurricanes are something that I'm really interested in um, in order to just continue. Um, I hope I somewhat answered that question. Um, we also have two questions around um, your audience and your supporters um, of El Departamento de la Comida. Um, who are they? And also um, a second question that we have that I think is quite interesting is um, what is your demographic in terms of who is working with you or who's engaging with you? Students, young adults, family, older people, what's their economic class? Um, who participates the most and how does their involvement differ? Um, how do you connect with people from different backgrounds? Uh, yeah, um, so we don't have that much like extra time to like give you numbers on these things. Um, but I will say um, our demographics have changed depending on what we're doing and where we're at. Um, when we started El Departamento, it was out of a warehouse in Bayamon um, and it was not open to the public. And we started with 60 CSA shares. Um, and the same experience was my mother's experience when she started a CSA. She actually had to deliver, there's that siren, Christina. She mm -hmm. actually had to deliver boxes from the mountain town of Ibonito to San Juan, an hour and 15 minutes away, and to Rincón, which is two and some hours away, because nobody around her at that point wanted a CSA box for different reasons, right? Now my sister is following the same CSA program and they do have different routes. So it really depends on the model because some models, like if I don't understand what a CSA is or if I don't really know if I can afford a CSA, obviously I can't be a part of it. And so that's also something that we've learned throughout the years to also think about. Um, so when we started the CSA, people needed access to internet feel comfortable putting a credit card online um, and want a surprise box of veggies every week. And honestly, those first people were family members and friends, and we were only distributing in San Juan. Um, that's also the reason why we decided to open like your regular mom and pop shop, particularly because my own friends were like, I don't have $30 a week to give into a CSA. And I was like, cool. So they need to be able to buy in a way that's more accessible to them. And that's when we opened in Trastalleres Santurce, um, which is very much a working class neighborhood. And we had special discounts for our own neighbors. And they were just happy that we weren't some kind of like art gallery, that we were actually cooking some really amazing food. And we had our own internal bartering with our neighbors as well. Um, when we started cooking food and we focused on our kitchen, a lot of the obstacles that we encountered were people that just for whatever reason were not willing to pay um, a little bit extra for this food. So they wanted cheap, accessible prices to them. Um, and I 
this came from so many different economic backgrounds, let me be clear. Um, and there was something that we realized people were like, I'm not paying $12 for this plate of handmade gnocchi. <laughs> um, and it was really difficult for us, speaking of finances, to figure out like, wait a minute, our farmers need to get paid fairly. We need to pay ourselves somehow. We have rent to pay. And also we're really not trying to be some fancy ass restaurant because we never were. We were coming out of a garage, but we need to be clear and honest and transparent that we actually do have a lot of costs. And so we started sharing with people, right? And that's when we realized having a restaurant next to a store and having people access literally the receipts of farmers so that they actually knew that two thirds of the price of their plate was going directly towards those products. That was something that allowed us to kind of like gain an understanding that we were never in this for some sort of a profit. And it wasn't necessarily our fault that these plates came to a certain cost. So it was really also thinking about like, if this is something to become addressed by all of us, right? And we don't necessarily have all the answers and we definitely don't have like all of the support to be able to do this. Like we need to include people in other parts of the process. Uh, we've also at some moment um, started to include volunteers or people that would do work exchanges in exchange for food, similar to what I did. In terms of demographics, um, we right now work with, in the community of San Salvador, it's mostly elders, um, very few young people. <laughs> um, we also, like I said, have our queer community that some live in San Juan, some live in Sabana Grande, some live in Ponce, some live in Pennsylvania. Um, there's like this whole trade between queer family that we go to different farm and food projects and support each other. That is definitely a big demographic within the collective. Um, we get a lot of students. And since the hurricanes, we were getting a lot of students um, and their professors coming on trips. Um, and for us, it was really important to like make sure that if they are visiting, that all of their resources were able to be distributed to our communities, especially money. Um, and in terms of demographics, yeah, they've changed. I, at the restaurant, we always had a farmer that would be eating because they of course had 50% off everything. Our own employees, which had 50% off everything. And then we would get, you know, somebody that was like into wellness and practicing yoga or a vegan or a person that was on their lunch break from work or a person that literally was hanging out for three hours. We really had a little bit of everything um, in terms of demographics of our social media accounts. I can say that half of our followers are not in Puerto Rico. Um, and that has to do with obviously like the amount of articles. And it also has to do a lot with the diaspora of Puerto Rico and the support and the connection that they want. And they really have been very supportive of food projects in Puerto Rico. Um, and I get to, you know, meet people in New York City, Boricuas that are also doing amazing work and that are connected to other food projects, right? I have a woman who's a cook um, for the Lower East Side Girls Club. Her name is Nancy. And she and her friends are in connection with this farm that does sofrito. And like they help each other sell sofrito across the ocean. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, demographics in terms of my experience have been very just diverse. Okay, we have four minutes left. Um, so I'll read out one last question um, and then we will wrap up. Hola Tara, it's admirable how you use food, community, queerness, as a natural material to design and build community and spaces. Do you see these materials evolve in a way that can accommodate new ways of looking at design? Using these new tools to redesign the restaurant, the community center, the farmhouse, et cetera. This is from our friend, Serban. 
So yes, Servan, um, I have been learning so much from them and I definitely have been realizing that I actually don't know shit. <laughs> um, the more I read, the more I'm like, damn, I am not in the know. Um, and so I think it's really important. I am not an expert on this material. I really wanna say that. Um, I'm still learning from a lot of my mentors but definitely from the way that we are running our organization, from the way that I've even defined like my own family and from the way that I you know, originally decided to buy a piece of land and was like, why would I be the sole owner of this? That definitely is all influenced um, from what I have been learning. Um, and I do think that there is a lot that's going on right now um, and for me, it's not a coincidence that all of these things are happening, right? That are related to race, that are related to identities. And all of them are just related to like the end of capitalism, so to speak. And I really wanna bring forth that all of these practices, um, you know, sometimes they don't call it queerness. I might go to another place and they don't even know what that term is. Um, but all of these practices are built on, you know, mutual aid, and I guess like one of the terms that I really feel that like Lex has brought into play a lot are these shared resources, right? Thinking about how we're sharing our resources, thinking about how that actually brings forth um, abundance and wealth for all of us um, has been really beautiful and I'm still learning. So hope I shared a little bit of it and very excited to also learn from other people about it. Okay, with our very last minute, what is one thing El Departamento is working on for the future? So, good question. Great. Uh, with the one minute we have left, we literally are trying to open up our kitchen. We are not reopening as a restaurant. Yay, restaurants are dead. <laughs> um, but we really want to start Puerto Rico's all local sustainable product line. And so we are going to be opening our kitchen in our space of San Salvador, 2020, 2021. Nothing will stop us. Um, and so we're right now in the process of opening that. However, we need to open that um, and has, as we have done before with whatever we have and things will come. Um, but we will be really dedicated to starting to preserve a lot of these crops you know, a lot of preservation involved and creating products that we can have just in the way somebody might have a can of tuna or spam that you can also have some like fresh, local, sustainable veggies that will survive the next storm. Uh, so anybody interested in that or helping or supporting, please reach out. And thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question, everyone who joined us today, who sent us um, support through the chat. Um, so excited that we were able to make this happen um, on Zoom. Uh, we were supposed to do this in April and we rescheduled a few times, but we, we did it. And tomorrow, um, as I mentioned, as Tara has mentioned, and I believe um, there's been some uh, links put in the chat tomorrow. Tara and her colleagues will be leading a workshop on seed exchange. Please join us. It's free um, and it'll be really fun. So thank you. Thank you to my Cooper Hewitt uh, colleagues for making this all happen. And thank you to Tara and all of you. Have a really wonderful, great day. Um, and make sure to check out Tara's um, website, El Departamento de la Comida. And if you have any specific questions, um, I'm sure I'm, I'm throwing this out there, Tara, but I'm sure you'll be able to um, answer and we'll be happy to hear from, from all of you who, who have joined us today. So Show up at the workshop tomorrow. It's gonna be great. <laughs> Thank you. Bye everybody, gracias, lindo día.